Yo, what's up, y'all? Today we've got something a little bit different than our normal scheduled programming. Uh, I'm going to take a mini episode today to talk about how to generate endless attack vectors on a given web application. Um, I think this is something that we all sort of run into when we're attempting to hack a web application is you push, you push, you push, and then you're just out of attack vectors. Um, and over the years, I've put together uh, a couple tips and framework of sorts um, in order to help me get past those sort of plateaus that I reach when uh, auditing an application. So I thought I'd take some time to share those with you today. <laughs> Before we get into my content, I want to do a shout out um, to uh, a piece of content that I think is one of the finest pieces on this topic, and that is uh, the NahamCon 2023 talk by Douglas Day, aka the Archangel. Um, and he talks about in that in that um, in that video, he talks about this concepts of nodes within an application and how um, a lot of the vulns that he finds comes from his knowledge of the application and how he uh, walks through the app and looks for nodes or things that he shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, and so. Uh, I'm not going to try to go over that and uh, reiterate everything that he says in there. Definitely go just Google Naham Khan, um, Douglas Day, or the Archangel, um, and put that into uh, uh, put that into YouTube and watch that video. Excellent content there, um, and definitely keep an eye out for that concept of nose when you're searching when you're reading through the application. Um, look for things that you shouldn't be able to do. Let me give that a shot. He also does a shout out a, a little bit in that in that um, YouTube video to this whole concept of RBAC matrixing, so um, role based access control matrixing, matrixing, creating a matrix uh, about uh, the role back based access controls on a specific site. Um, and I think that's a really insightful piece uh, of the talk as well, um, and really speaks to the thoroughness that Douglas takes and brings into any web application assessments that he does. And I've worked with Douglas many times on live hacking events, and I've seen firsthand the crazy attack vectors that he comes up with just by thoroughly, thoroughly understanding the application, getting it configured into all of its different states. Um, so. Definitely an expert on the topic, uh, so definitely check out that video. We'll link it down in the description below. Um, okay, so uh, on from from Douglas's tips uh, to mine. I've got let's see six different sections here that I want to talk about, and the first one is uh, kind of similar to what um, Douglas was talking about, but I have this written down: use the application like a human, not like a hacker. Okay, so oftentimes when I go into an application, I'm thinking, all right, how do I hack this? How do I hack this? How do I hack this? And that makes sense because that's our goal in the scenario, right? Is to be able to hack the application. But I think sometimes that is inversely helpful. It's, it's unhelpful for us to actually understand what the application is about, what data is being used in the application, what is important, what processes are important. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I remind myself to use the application like a human, um, what, essentially what I do is I leave Burp or Kaido or On or whatever I'm proxying just to keep all that traffic, but I don't use any of it and I just step through the application, the UI, like a human. I'm trying to figure out exactly what that application is supposed to be used for, what sort of user journeys the user would go on as they're going through that application and trying to get the application into a little bit more of a configured state. I ran into an example the other day of this uh, concept resulting in a bug when I was working on a website um, that essentially allowed you to configure specific devices. And so I selected one of the devices from the dropdown, and then it gave you a bunch of like options you could select. And I did this for a couple of the, the devices, but none of the options seemed really interesting. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, you know, let me be a little bit more thorough with my testing. Go, went back, kind of clicked through um, the various different types of of um, of devices that I could configure, and I found a, a device further down the list that allowed me to configure some special settings. And those settings resulted in a full read SSRF. Um, and so, definitely make sure you're you're one being thorough in your testing and exhausting all the user journey and code paths, um, and also using the application like a, like a human, 
not like a hacker. I don't know. Maybe that doesn't make a bunch of sense, but it kind of rings in my in my head. Um, all right, next, uh, reading the documentation and looking for cannot statements. Okay, this is so underrated; it's ridiculous. Like, and it, and it's not sexy, so I understand why most people don't do it. But um, going and just literally dumping the whole documentation for a product and reading it all, like literally sometimes during live hacking events when I'm like brain fried and I can't be at my computer anymore. I'll take the documentation for a product, export it to a PDF or, or get it in some sort of form that I can e get it on my e-reader. And I'll just take my e-reader out to a hammock and just like leisure read through the documentation. Okay, and when you're doing that, you're looking for a couple specific things. You're looking for cannot statements. So X user cannot do X, Y, Z. Um, you're, you're looking for uh, boundaries that have been set up in the, in the application, um, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, about later. Um, and like Douglas mentioned before, you're looking for those no's. You're looking for anything that says, um, you know, the limit on this is X, right? Because that's something that we could potentially bypass. And it always helps when you're writing a report too, to be able to reference a specific line of documentation. Because uh, if you can do that, it's very hard to debate that it's an issue because um, then you can start talking to the program about this whole concept, excuse me, this whole concept of user trust where you've built documentation for your product, the user you the user trusts you that this documentation is accurate, and then you violated that trust by um, creating a product that does not actually comply with the standards that you've set up for this user. So it makes for a very convincing argument in the context of a report, and I've never gotten, well, I can't say never. Sometimes they'll just say like, yeah, that's a documentation bug. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be there. But most of the time in their own documentation, they will, they will pay out the bounty um, for if you have a piece of documentation that contradicts what the application's actual functionality is. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, in addition to reading documentation, uh, not only the help documentation, but go and read the forums, go and read the help desk facts, go and read the GitHub issues, go and read the wikis, right? Um, just a couple live hacking events back, I found a bug um, in, in a piece of software, very widely used piece of software. And the way I found that was going to a GitHub issue. And I found an issue where <laughs> I, I found a, a um, yeah, an issue on GitHub issues uh, that said, hey, you know, there's this specific functionality that happens every once in a while that kind of sort, sort of looks like a security bug, but it's just a bug. And, and they're like, okay, we'll fix it. And so I looked into how that happened and I found a way to forcibly recreate it um, and force that bug to happen to other users. Resulted in a great bug and actually won me the most impactful um, bug on a specific target in the live hacking event. Um, so definitely don't skip those GitHub issues. Always search for things like security or um, any keywords that might be correlated to that specific products like disclosure, or, or um, leak or anything like that um, and read all the GitHub issues you can get your hands on to understand why that product is acting the way that it is in some, some weird scenarios. Okay. Um, next was look at the grayed out areas in the application. Now, this is pretty standard, but... Um, in an application, oftentimes there will be buttons that are disabled and, and um, text areas you're not supposed to be able to modify or write in. And we all know that once you know you submit the form or whatever, you can just add, you know, you can intercept it at that level, right? And uh, and modify text boxes that shouldn't be modifiable and stuff like that. And and sometimes that does result in vulnerabilities and is certainly something to be thinking about when you're coming up with attack vectors. Um, but I found that modifying things at the UI level allows you to use the application more like a human, right? And understand the flow that um, the application goes through, which may give you additional insight into request formatting and stuff like that. So you don't have to like fight with the format from a minified JS file or something of the like. Um, so that's that's a cool way to do it. Um, there's lots of ways you can do it. Uh, you can use uh, like a BERT match and replace or a Kaido match and replace to um, you know remove disabled elements. I personally have a um, uh, JavaScript bookmarklet that I've been using in my browser for a very long time uh, that will just go through and find every disabled element and undisable it, um, which is really helpful. And uh, it also takes hidden elements and unhides them, which is also helpful. Um, 
So maybe you can code up that uh, bookmarklet similar, or I'm sure there's better ways of doing it through like a Chrome extension or something of the like. Um, and I'm sure someone in the community will come up with a better solution than my hacky little bookmarklet. Um, so keep that technique in mind as well. Paying attention to those grayed out areas of the application, re-enabling those, and then walking through the code path um, in the UI so that you understand how everything, how the application flows, and maybe you can skip steps or something of the like. OK, next one is look for information that is in the UI, uh, or excuse me, that is not in the UI, but is in the API response, OK? So this can be indicative of a couple things. Uh, it can be indicative of the uh, API being used in other areas of the application, and they just you know bundle all that data together. Um, it could be indicative of legacy uh, features that are still there, right? So if you had a feature that uses a piece of information before, and they've removed that feature, um, Pay attention to what information is being returned in that API recall or that API response because uh, it will lead you to understanding uh, what that application functionality was in the past. And you might even be able to look up like um, JS files on Web Archive or something of the like uh, to be able to figure out why that functionality was there. Um, or it, it can also just kind of inform your gut and allow you to make a more educated guess on maybe fields that you could modify in other places of the application, or even um, uh, even like if the application has like a starred out area of like text and but that text is in the API response. Sometimes programs will accept bugs like that because they're trying to prevent uh, that leak, even if someone does get access to the person's account. So that's another that's another cool tip there is if you have particularly grayed out or censored information, maybe the social security number only has the last four digits, or maybe your email is only being shown the first character and then the at whatever.com. Um, if you can find a way to leak that, then that can violate the security boundaries and the threat model that that application has set up. And those are intentional security decisions that are being made by the team. So um, something to keep in mind there as well. This doesn't always result in a bug, just mind you. And um, one of the quotes that I really loved <laughs> from Douglas's talk that I mentioned earlier was, make sure you evaluate the security impact of your nose, because sometimes there is no, no security impact. But um, in scenarios, like I mentioned before, where there's an intentional security decision made to conceal a certain piece of information, if you can leak that information, it might be of something of interest to the team. And we know that uh, unlike Joel or unlike some of the other hackers we have on this podcast, I am a big um, fan of submitting every bug that's a vulnerability, getting that money, whether it's a low or a medium or a crit or a high. Um, so uh, don't let that deter you. Let's get submitting those bugs anyway. Um, yeah, and, and so the next one that I had on the list here was look between uh, look for differences between in the UI between two different accounts. Okay, so if you've got a admin account and a non admin account, uh, or if you've got different tiers of um, RBAC uh, role based access controls, make sure you're looking at the differences in the UI as well, and that can tell you and inform you which areas of the application you should try to attack as the less privileged user. This also goes for. Um, for uh, applications that have different like user tiers, I guess that are not really accessible to the normal user. For example, if you have like a support agent or a staff um, account, try to figure out what is informing the client side that that user um, or that support agent or staff account is is a staff account, and then try to replicate that on your account because then you may be able to walk through so much of the application on the client side much easier uh, rather than having to dig through JS files and break your brain trying to read minified JavaScript. OK, last one that I had here on the list was paywalls. Um, anytime there's a paywall, we talk about this all the time um, you know, on the podcast. Anytime there's a paywall, just pay it. Just, just, just pay the pay, bypass the paywall with one account uh, by paying it, right? And then have the other account and try to access some of those same features. It's so often that I see you know, people say, oh, this feature is only available in the premium, but that's just a function of something that they've exposed on the, on the, on the UI. And I, I imagine that this is a part of uh, sort of a flawed development cycle, right? Um, that they're developing this whole product, and then they're saying, OK, well, where do we want to put these tiers in? And I right, let's put the tiers here, 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 right? And they kind of tweak that over time, right? Um, but a lot of that stuff is just happening in the front end, uh, and it's not being implemented on the back end as well after the functionality's already been developed. 
Okay, so as a as a as a review. We talked about checking out that awesome talk by Douglas Day um, on nose and and how to you know search for nose within an application to come up with great attack vectors. Um, using the application like a human, not like a hacker. Try to figure out how the app works, what makes sense in the application um, uh, from a user's perspective. And literally, just don't even look at your, your HTTP proxy. Just use the application and get it into weird configured states, right? Um, read the documentation, and not only the documentation, read forms, read GitHub issues, read help desk stuff, read wikis, read all that shit, <laughs> and assimilate it all, and try to understand the far-reaching breadth of this application. Re understand the deepest depths of this application. You have to get intimate with the application in these scenarios. Um, so make sure you're reading everything about it, right? Um, look for grayed out areas in the application and try to use those to indicate um, where some of the security boundaries might be. Um, and this is also a great indicator uh, in a report like, hey, no, this button is specifically disabled and I am able to utilize it. It's very hard to, hard to debate with that in the context of a report. Um, look for information that is not in the UI but is in the API response that can inform where old legacy features might have been, or what kind of information is getting stored in different objects, which can lead to other vulnerabilities. Um, look for the differences in the UI between two different accounts of different tiers, uh, tier level. Um, so this could be sort of an RBAC situation, or it could be like a, like a more vertical um, privilege escalation to like staff user or something of the like, which you can emulate via match and replace on the client side once you've identified how the client side is, is identifying those users. And then finally, paywalls. Make sure you're, you're not shying away from that $20, $30 investment to get a two or three K bug. All right, that's it for today. Hope you all got something out of that. Um, let me know if I missed anything. Shoot me a message on Twitter or uh, on the uh, at info at criticalthinkingpodcast.io if you've got any more cool attack vector um, thinking, attack vector formulation tips that you'd like to share. All right, see you all next week.